Well, look, thanks for asking me to come today and just to share with you some of, um, I guess, the learnings that we're getting from the work of Mana Kaha or the Enabling Good Lives Systems Transformation Process in Palmerston North. And I think, importantly, to talk about um, what I think some of the challenges are going to be for providers and how providers might need to really uh, fundamentally rethink uh, the models of service that, that they deliver and how they deliver service in order to be uh, well positioned to be successful in a, in a transformed service environment. Um, and I'm very open to any questions. I mean, we're only two months in, but two months in, um, we're certainly able to see pretty much what's happening on the ground and pretty much some of the challenges that any systems transformation will face, but uh, most particularly for this group of people, um, what, uh, what providers are going to need to be thinking about. And I think um, the longer you've got to think about that and to really critically examine the uh, models and contracts and processes that you use, the better. Um, certainly, over the last two months, one of the things that has become very, very apparent in to me and um, very clear in my mind is that we've got, I would say, decades of not just unmet need in our community but unrecognised need. Uh, and as you start to get alongside of people in an authentic, um, collaborative way rather than just a checklist of what you're functionally not able to do, some of that needs just starts to really expose itself. And we just do not appear to have any capacity to respond to it um, in the community currently. And, um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, I think that it's very difficult to try and address that level of unmet need without investment. Uh, and, and that's a conversation that has to be had. I think also that it's very clear that early intervention hasn't occurred and families have not received support until the point of complete collapse and crisis and then our capacity to respond to that on the ground is um, extremely weak. We really uh, don't have uh, the, ca the capacity to do that and I think um, providers' capacity to respond is fundamentally hampered in two ways. One is the model of service that has essentially um, been in this country really the post-institutional model which is a congregate care model and you can't respond to fundamental need from a congregate care model and when you do try to use that congregate care model to respond to need, in fact you just perpetuate the need because people's lives become constrained by the capacity of the service to deliver anything to them and you find that um, behaviour um, challenges increase, school capacity reduces, capacity to be engaged in community and in, in freely given relationship reduces and so we uh, really perpetuate an institutional approach. So really thinking about the model and the other major constraint is in fact the way that model's contracted so that providers, even if they want to be flexible and responsive within the model, really can't do that because the contract precludes them from doing it. So the two major changes, I think, fundamentally, the model has to move from a congregate care model to some form of life development, socially inclusive uh, model. And, and, um, and that means we have to move away from this notion that we can standardise the responses that we give to people. people. People's needs and people's issues do not come in standardised ways and we will not. We talk about having met the need, but in fact we haven't. We've simply provided a band-aid service solution over the top of that need and haven't been responsive uh, to the needs of people. So we really need to challenge the standardised service model and look to an individually designed set of supports for people. So rather than, um, I guess the way I just describe it in simple terms is we have to shift away from this idea that we're a service 
to the idea that we are authentically of service to this person, not to this group of people who all happen to come with some kind of common label, because the only thing they have in common is the label. Their needs are fundamentally different, their aspirations are different, so every single person needs to become a service and you design the service. I mean, providers everywhere I go are talking about being person-centred, but you know, if I'm going to be really honest, they are system-centred and staff-centred, and the needs of the service are met first, and if it's possible to meet the needs of the people at some point, um, they endeavour to do that. And the, the effort to meet the needs of the people generally comes from hands-on front um, you know, hands-on staff, who are the support staff, who are the least uh, influential and the least uh, invested in. So we really need to work out how do we how do we design services genuinely by knowing that person and what a response to that person would look like. Which means we can't we have to shift away from this notion that we've got a vacancy. We don't have a vacancy. We either have capacity to deliver a service to somebody that makes sense to them, or we don't. Uh, we also need to have a much, much stronger vision. W what you see in community, where you see families in particular, disabled people, but young families suffering from weak vision coming from the service centre. And, and what that leads to is very low expectations of disabled people almost the vilification of families at times because they can't manage the situation and and therefore the life aspirations of people are constrained by the capacity of the service to deliver it and if we're going to be really successful in um, actually changing the social value of disabled people in this country and use this mechanism to do it as providers we really need to have very high expectations and what that challenges uh, a provider system is we have to move, and a ministry system, uh, might I add, we have to move away from this uh, almost paranoia that we have about risk management. We are very risk averse, and because we are risk averse, we then constrain the lives of people. And we know ourselves that you cannot have success if you don't have opportunity. Uh, if everything is constrained, then how do you ever learn? How do you learn if you're not allowed to make a mistake? Um, and so it is really coming right back to our policies and examining, do our policies enhance the social value and life opportunity of this person, or do they simply protect the back of the organisation and safeguard the ministry if something gets on the front page? Because we have to move uh, towards actually being of service to the person. And this might mean that you have a different risk management process for every person, because every person has a different risk tolerance. And thinking about where does risk, where does risk responsibility lie? Does it rely, lie always with the provider? Because if a person is in fact engaging in activities uh, with other legitimate organisations, the risk may in fact lie somewhere else. And so thinking about, uh, thinking about that. We also have to give much more power and authority to the people who are closest to the disabled person, and that's generally support workers. Instead of having these rigid hierarchies where decisions are made a long way away from the coalface, often by people who have never met the person being served, um, we need to look at how we create models that give authority to disabled people, their families, and the staff closest to them. And you know, that means we have to train people properly. That means we have to give people the skills to be able to be decision makers in the lives of people without fearing the consequence of uh, larger organisations. And I think that it, it it's almost certain that the smaller organisations are going to be able to do this more quickly and more easily than the larger ones, um, simply because the smaller ones have less of a corporate burden to deal with, and also they, are, they tend to be more embedded in community and closer aligned to that community, and so can uh, draw on those communities, uh, have relied on 
being able to draw on communities in order for, to, to survive and to function, where bigger organisations tend to have isolated themselves from community and become the whole of the life of the person. Other things that I think we, that are going to really impact on providers, and you have to think about how you're going to deal with this, segregated services are not going to be an option. So where you segregate and congregate people together in order to do something to them or for them, that is not what people are seeking in their life. And in fact, it's almost impossible to congregate and segregate people and talk about being person-centred and socially inclusive. Those things just uh, can't happen together. So think about how you design services where people might be in the in relationship with other people but not congregated together by a provider. And I, some of the things I, I'm thinking about, just some people we're working with currently, uh, a young man, for example, who's been in a day service, his passion is carving. Now, he's not in the day service anymore, but he is in a small group of people at the um, Horofenua Learning Centre who are interested in carving and who are learning to become carvers. So he's not supported as a one-on-one, -on -one, whatever that means, but he is supported to have his needs met with people of like interest uh, in a small group where he can learn and develop. And this is the kind of work that connectors are doing, the whole terminology of connector is that we connect people to all of the resources that exist in community that uh, are available to meet their needs, and the paid resource comes last. So as providers, you need to think about, hey, there's huge role for providers, but it is about thinking about how you do that differently and how you work in a very different model. And I think that the two final sort of points I, I have for providers really is, I don't know, I mean I've been around so long I almost forget, but for at least the last 25 years we've, we've or, or since deinstitutionalisation really, we've spoken about the role of services is to provide social inclusion for people and yet we have done nothing to provide social inclusion for people. And we have very weak social inclusion, even though we have the rhetoric of it. And we really need to start to become very strong in our uh, capacity to include people and to know how to build roles and relationships for people in the ordinary places of community. I and mean, one of the things that I think is quite overwhelming for me, I mean, it's amazing how you know these things, but when you confront them so starkly on a daily basis, is how deeply lonely and isolated disabled people are and families, even quite young families. And yet we have very few providers who are authentically talking about building social circles for people, uh, having service delivered through informal networks, sustaining the informal network rather than being the direct provider of the service. And these are things that need to be thought about. And I think, um, it's increasingly clear that over the years, uh, in order to manage the fiscal constraints that we all have, we have underschooled the whole sector and we have very weak leadership around uh, how to build alternative models. In fact, when I talk to providers about it, even though they're very keen to do that, they don't even know where to start. So our leadership is quite weak and we really need to be looking, I think, to grassroots leadership and building leadership. Uh, one of the, the strategies that we are uh, using is to build the leadership capacity of families because if we can get families to be really clear about what it is that would make a difference uh, not what it is that might be on offer, but what it is that would make a difference then and how to help families to hold a vision of a life that is full, that is meaningful to the person and that is inclusive in their in, in community and family, then I think we start to build some leadership, but we have let leadership in the sector flag and um, it desperately needs investment in. So I think in 
the two months really that we have been actively working on the ground, these would be the things that I think are absolute key uh, for providers to be working on because this process, we must change the way in which we've functioned. And, you, you know, with the greatest of good intent, we haven't got outcomes for disabled people that have advanced their well-being and value in New Zealand society, and we can't continue to uh, use the resource, limited though it is, to continue to keep people in that um, situation. I'm just, you know, I was quite, in the first week that Manawhai Kaha was operating, we had 300 people connect, contact the service wanting a connector because they were unhappy with their service. We now have close on 500 people in two months uh, who are wanting fundamental changes. Either Most of them actually are quite happy with their provider. They just want the provider to provide what they want. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and that's quite challenging for providers because providers have been constrained in their capacity to provide what people want. Um, we are also seeing a very significant number of those people choosing to move away from contracted services to personal budgets. Now that is something that actually provides a great deal of opportunity to providers because in fact what you then have is a whole lot of people who are private payers. And that means you need to understand your costs and your prices because people are going to come to you and say, I want to purchase this, how much is it going to cost me? And how comparative are you to this other person who will also, um, is also I'm also speaking with? And so a lot of that authority now is coming back to the disabled person and their family and their uh, support network. But what it does mean for providers who have sorted some of this stuff is you're not bound by the terms of the contract. You have an agreement with the person that you are providing a service for, and that is signed between uh, the two of you, and your accountability is back to that person, not back to some kind of nebulous um, system that uh, is, is trying to operate. Well, you know, the ministry wants good outcomes for people. There's no doubt about that, but the... the there are so other, other, many other influences on the ministry that constrain their capacity uh, to do that. But when you are just in relationship with that person and their family, then that's a very different way of understanding how to provide. And we are still getting providers saying, oh, no, we can't provide for you because we don't have a contract for whatever. And, oh, no, we can't provide because you haven't come with a support needs assessment. And But hang on, I've come with some money. Isn't that the important thing? Um, and so that deeply ingrained constraints that have been placed on providers, you have to have the courage to lift those and to say, now, if everyone here was a private payer, what could we offer? What would it look like? And really get that in train now so that when enabling good lives and the, the ability, you know, because the great thing about where we're heading, we're not quite there is people through their connector will have access not just to disability support funding, they'll have access to their ACC funding, to MSD funding. We haven't quite cracked education yet, but they can get all that bundled up. And we have the only thing in education we have cracked, which is fantastic, is a transition. So they can get all of that bundled up in a personal budget and say, now, this is the resource I've got to play with, uh, around building the life outcome and opportunity that I want for myself or for my uh, son and daughter. Uh, I think the other really big constraint that providers may well have a capacity to have a role in is, as would be expected, we have a lot of people wanting to move out of group homes, never wanted to be in group homes in the first place, hate the people they live with, uh, want some authority o over their own lives, want to control who comes in and out of their house. We just can't get accommodation. And the reason we can't get accommodation 
is because providers have been essentially driven by the service model to provide everything in group homes. You know, we've got to get rid of those. And we've got to look at how do we invest in very different housing models. And instead of, um, instead of when somebody leaves, running around in panic because we've got a vacancy. Now, I know some of that's driven by the contract because the contractual price is based on um, these rooms being filled. Um, it's not the case when you've got private payers. So start really thinking about, could we diversify our housing stock? And if we could diversify our housing stock, what would that look like? Particularly if we're thinking about people wanting to live in inclusive communities. Um, you know, we've got some providers thinking, oh, we could buy an old motel. Well, no, people don't want to live with other disabled people in a little motel unit that everybody circles around and avoids. But um, if you had a block of units where a couple of them had uh, capacity for disabled people to live in and their neighbours were not disabled people, then you start to create a very different culture of what society might look like and where supports, in fact, uh, might come from. And I think then, you know, the obvious, the obvious other major change, and even though this has occurred not through any intention that it occurs, but it's occurred because of the nature of services, is we have to shift from services having power over people to being in right relationship with people. And it's interesting when I talk to staff about that, often the staff don't even see the power role that they have. And they don't, they exercise power unconsciously over the lives of people. And to me, that is a, a training it is a skill development that they haven't got, and it also speaks to a deep lack of any reflective practice occurring um, as a, a regular, constant approach uh, within service delivery. So I don't know, I think that's probably what I've got to say, really, unless there's any questions. so much, Lorna, for now. I will open this room now for the questions, um, if, because you're here now, <laughs> um, really to hear if there's any questions in particular that you would like to ask Lorna at the moment. Yes, there is. So I'm going to go with my microphone and come back to you. <laughs> Are you going to put the central microphone on? That's great. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Nikki Irvine. I'm a parent of a 21-year-old. What can we do now? to make this happen? You know, I think the absolute, this won't happen unless families take charge of it. I, I honestly, truly believe that because <coughs> all of these changes, when you think about it, have been driven by the needs of families. Even the current services we've got have originated from families. I think the most important thing families can have is a very big vision for what they seek to achieve and what's possible in their sons and daughters' lives and to relentlessly pursue that vision. And do that, if you possibly can, in relationship with other people. Because we're certainly, the isolation of families is one of the major reasons that we find people um, defaulting to residential service options. So the more that families can uh, generate almost a movement um, amongst themselves so that they can hold that vision, hold true to that vision, and resist, actually, the enormous wave of pressure that constantly um, comes on families to comply with whatever the service craze is at the particular moment. And I think if you can do that and to get other families on that journey, you'll be in a prime place. Hi, firstly, thank you very much. That was really insightful. Um, and a question around your insights on uh, very high needs, those with very high needs, unverbal, um, without families to advocate for them. I What's think, happening there? you know, we have got a lot of those people. And I, I mean, I'm working in the Palmerston area where the deinstitutionalisation of Kimberley um, has left us with a number of those people who, whose families now are gone. Um, I think 
for young kiddies coming on who have uh, significant multiple needs, we can have very different life aspirations for, and we must have very different life aspirations for, because I don't care whether a person can talk, can move, can, whatever they can do, life can be something that is lived to the full and um, can have joy. I think the reality is, if we're going to be brutally honest, we probably have a generation of people for whom it will be very, very difficult to get uh, substantive change. And we have to think quite creatively about those people. Could life get better for them? Absolutely, it could. And that then, I think, becomes the question. What would bring joy and fulfilment to this life, given how it has been lived until now and the expectations that have been had of this person. But it's not without its challenges. Um, that's absolutely true. And I think that you find when we've got numbers of people with profound disabilities congregated together, it becomes even harder because really what we find ourselves doing is simply caring. And the caring just becomes all-encompassing because of the demand that it, it places on support people. But if we could, if we could look at um, significantly disabled people being in a less constrained environment, I, I just think we'll have to work together on the challenges, and I don't believe they're going to be easily resolved in, in, in the first phase of this. But for young kids, let's not trap them there. I think the other absolutely critical issue, and we no surprise to any family here, is education is failing disabled children, fundamentally failing disabled children. And where I see the families, you see families managing until their kid gets kicked out of school, and the number of kids that are denied access to education, and then education not putting any resource into that family at all, is where we really see the complete breakdown of the capacity of the family to support their son or daughter. And this is where systems transformation, which is not, I mean, enabling good lives is part of it, but it is really about the system it's trying to work as one cohesive system around disabled people, where I think we've got some capacity for traction. but. Um, we're certainly nowhere near it at this point. Any other questions? Hello, I'm, I'm Lee from Waikato. Uh, I just want to ask you, what model um, worldwide are you looking at would, that would be really um, successful in delivering this type of system transformation? I worked in Ireland for 14 and a half years and uh, have been back for four years and feel like I've stepped back 10 years. Um, they're way ahead and uh, they still have problems over there, but I don't know. I've been trained by Michael Kendrick many times. He visited every month, really. And um, leadership was the big thing he pushed. Mm -hmm. And it had to start at the top. And uh, attitudes had to change. It was about values and attitudes, staff uh, going along with actual system change, because there was definitely, um, um, <laughs> I can say it, nobody wanted to change uh, from a, a congregate type of setting. Uh, to individualise services, mm -hmm. but um, as I was leaving Ireland um, those four years ago, I noticed there was starting to see, we were starting to see some um, really good work going on, and um, yeah, I, I can see we're nowhere near it here. Uh, yeah, well look, I've worked a lot in Ireland as well, and yes, I would say there are little pockets of goodness in Ireland as there are little pockets of goodness here. But a whole system is a, is a different issue. And I think, you know, it's very difficult for hands-on support workers to have the courage to do things when the leadership doesn't give authority. And so really the role of leadership is to pass authority as far down as it possibly can and give some very clear frameworks within which people can operate. And 
I think there are numbers of models that uh, are needed because you can't have, as soon as you go, well, this is the model, then we're right back to where we started from because that's what we've got now, the model. But you've really got to think of what, are, what models, what approaches to delivering the service, what approach to being of service to people will actually enhance the life opportunities, competency, capacity and inclusion of those people. So it's, it's really thinking about lifestyle development irrespective of the stage of life that a person is at. And if you really think of almost like you know a culturally valued analogue, if you work from the basis of a culturally valued analogue, that is what is what does this culture value for a person of this age in this community and start there and ask the question, why, would, why can this person not access that? Or what support would the person require in order to access that? That's the support that's needed, not this much support, this much support. Uh, and the more, you know, services have spent a lot of years and a lot of effort driving freely given relationships out of the lives of people, even driving families out of the lives of people. Spend a bit of effort bringing them back in, you know, and encouraging neighbours, encouraging families, encouraging people who reach out. We've become so risk averse that, you know, we expect people, you can see why people are deeply lonely and isolated, because if you can't have a friend without them being police checked, you're in trouble, aren't you? Um, so we've really got to change this whole culture of disabled people are not the commodity of a service. Disabled people and families are equal human beings with equal citizenship rights here and they are not owned by any paid person. So start to think about that and what would it look like then if you were truly to be of service to this person and then your model will start to form in your mind and then you can operationalise it. I'm used to a bigger microphone. <laughs> Hi, Lorna. Oh, Myron from Supported Employment Agency in the Bay of Plenty. I've heard you speak recently about um, a, an example, mm -hmm. um, and you talked about individual budgets rather than individualised funding. Yeah. You spoke of a man that was from Fielding that you were working with about moving him to Palmerston North. He was wanting to move. I'm just curious as to what happened. Um, Do you want to share that story? Look, at this stage, we've only been able to successfully move one person out of a group home into their own place, but we have a number of... And that's because of, we can't get accommodation. Um, not because the people are not desperately ready to move. Um, and we have got no providers in Palmerston North who are doing life share models. Um, we've got some supported living providers, but they struggle with accommodation uh, just as we do. So what that young man is now... <laughs> what we're hoping to be able to do is... Because transport is another big issue, as will not be a surprise to anybody. Um, yeah, well, no, at least in Auckland you've got some. <laughs> Um, you try to get from Otaki to Palmerston North, uh, you just can't do it. Um, so we're, we're working currently with the hospital that runs these health shuttles and seeing if we can get spaces on those regular health shuttles to get him into Palmerston North so he can get to Yukol, Um which will... Ha you know, the interesting thing is we even tried to get him a, a student accommodation at Massey. There is no accessible student accommodation at Massey. Now, what's the message there? Um, so these are the challenges that uh, we can't let be barriers. And I think in the past we've had, we've just said, oh, we tried that. We cannot do that. We have to continue to beat the system until it delivers uh, for people. Um, and that means if I've got connectors out talking to every land agent in town, um, trying to get them to reserve accessible accommodation for us to give us the first offer on any um, small units, that's what we're doing because 
that's the shift from being a needs assessor to a connector. It is actually working with the person until we get a solution. It doesn't matter how long that takes. Um, I've got a question about um, who are our Auckland connectors? Well, you Do don't we... have any because this yeah. is a prototype in uh, Palmerston North at the moment. Um, for the next two years, and you'd, you'd be quite pleased it's not in Auckland at the moment, because honestly and truly, there are no systems. It's a, you, you could describe it as a bit of a bugger's muddle right at the moment, <laughs> but it'll sort itself out because those they are just systems. Uh, but if you tried to put that in Auckland where the systems were not strong, it would collapse. There's just too many people. But the point of the matter is, irrespective of um, how the government or the ministry determines the success or otherwise of this prototype, we cannot go back to the old system. We're now on a path to really fundamentally having a different a way of understanding and being of service to people. And this will happen in Auckland within the next four to five years. So you have the advantage, really, of watching and being able to reshape over a period of time. And I think it takes that long. Uh, and so I think it requires different conversations with the ministry about, well, enabling good lives are happening. Why wouldn't all Auckland providers have a flexible disability service contract now so that you, you can begin the process and begin to get a sense of what it's going to take to shape it up and you're not just waiting until this hits the ground and then you can't deliver? Another quick question. Do you have any training in place in, for the, the support workers and things in um, mid-central? And how would you envisage that well, happening? We don't have training in place for support workers because that's not our role. We certainly have training in place for connectors. Um, but the provider organisations really need to think about what training will shift people from this model to this model. Um, and, you know, personally, I think the, the whole training needs to be completely redesigned uh, and really needs to start with some fundamental um, understanding of what is my role if I am a support person. You know, what is a home and what are the rights of people within their home and how do you operate, how do you act within a home? I think you've got to, um, you've got to think about uh, relationship. Right, what is a right relationship? between a disabled person and somebody who's paid to be in their life, or the disabled person and their family and somebody who's paid uh, to be in their life. You know, quite frankly, I, I, I'm, I'm assailed by silliness from some providers, honestly and truly. Um, and I'm not quite sure where the, where the silliness comes from, because sometimes, you know, people say it comes from the contract. When you look at your contract, you think, well, really? Or, or does it just come from a myth that's established and then generated and generated and generated? Um, the key question is what's going to make a difference in the life of this person and that's what we do. And it doesn't matter whether somebody says, oh, well, the theory of the month is you do this. No, the theory of the month might be fine, but actually what this person needs is something quite else. And I just an experience this week of a a young couple with intellectual disabilities who've just had a little baby. And of course, you know what that's like. You've got Oranga Tamariki with um, vulture wings out here. And so to try and sustain the situation, the grandmother has given up her life and come to live with the, <laughs> the young couple. It, that may or may not be a great thing, but, but what it does is... Um, at least stabilise it. At least Oranga Tamariki can go away and know that there's, the child will be safe. But the provider we had in there to help develop, help sustain the situation, now won't take any instructions from the mother, from the grandmother, because she's only here to support the mother. And she won't do anything for the child because that's the mother's role. And, she, and I mean, really? Um, in fact, the grandmother went out for the day the child had not been fed from 10 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock because it wasn't the role of the support worker to feed the child. Um, 
And so, you see, when things deteriorate to stupidity of that nature, um, you can see why people don't want to have anything to do with services, uh, because the family just feels completely let down. Uh, and, you know, all it will take for this grandmother to say, I can't do this anymore, I'm out of here, for the whole family to collapse. Uh, hi, Lorna. Jade Farrer, National Leadership Group in Manawanui. Um, as a dis disabled person, just wanted to reflect on one of your recent blogs, not the latest one, but maybe the one before. You know, as a, as a disabled person, can you explain to me how I know when my life is good? Um, I think it, probably the same way as the rest of us. Um, when we feel that we're getting some successes, when we feel we have some personal autonomy and authority over our life, um, and life isn't good in perpetuity, it has its ups and downs, but in fact, in many respects, it's the ups and downs that makes life good, isn't it? And I think that, you know, when you sort of ask the question, well, what are the good things in life? If you could name five good things, five things that make life good, you generally get a pretty consistent set of answers. You get family, friends, a home, purpose, work or purpose in life, financial security, uh, passions, uh, passions and interests. So I think if you're, if, you're at, if you're working with any person, disabled person or not, you've got to be having these things in, their, in your mind. Are we getting these things right? Because when you look at a lot of those things, most of them don't cost money or require support staff, um, but they require a very different way of society engaging with people. And although I know we're very free at saying, well, society is very rejecting, I think we've also got to reflect on our role in that, because as services, we've actually pushed society out and said, no, uh, we'll take care of this over here. You don't need to worry about that. And we have to change that, because there are a lot of people in society who actually are interested in being in relationship with disabled people. We've just denied them the opportunity. So I can't speak for your good life, I'm sorry. I mean, I can only speak for mine, and as I'm getting old, I think you only kind of get a sense of whether life has been good in retrospect. You know, if you asked me yesterday, I might have thought, no, it's absolutely shitty. I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm stuck in Palmerston North. Um, but <laughs> overall, have I been blessed and privileged in life? Yes, I have, because I've been enabled to engage the struggles and the challenges and the successes and the relationships and the roles that this country has offered, and I feel deeply privileged for that, and I would like to see every person feel they get to this age and be able to think, yes, I took it on, and I was enabled. <laughs>